Uh, we have Heather McGee, who's an NBC News analyst and is a senior fellow at Demos. We have Enrique Acevedo, who's a special correspondent for Univision's <coughs> News Division and is also an anchor of Noticiero Univision, Edición Nocturna. Great Spanish, wow. <laughs> and then we have Jane Costin, who's a senior political reporter at Vox. David Axelrod, our director here at the IOP. And then we have Joe Donnelly, who's a former Democratic senator from Indiana, and Tom Rainey, who's a former Republican congressman from Florida. And so with that, enjoy this wonderful conversation that we get to have with all you guys. Thank you. Thank you. You said it better than I could, so I, I, I'm, I'm so happy to have you uh, make that introduction. Um, can we just go down the row here and talk about, uh, we'll go this way, talk, just talk a little bit about what you, you're going to be talking about yeah. in your seminars. Great. Well, thank you all so much for coming out on this rainy afternoon. Um, this overflow crowd, really appreciate it, and I hope we'll, we'll be audible out there. Um, so I, again, I'm Heather McGee um, for Four years, I was the president of a progressive think tank called Demos, which works on issues, um, looks for solutions to inequality in our democracy and our economy. And in that role, I had the opportunity to help move really big solutions, big ideas uh, into the mainstream. And sometimes, when we were lucky and all the stars aligned and the strategy was right, into law. And I think right now we're at a moment when um, that's possible. And people are talking about really big ideas to the problems that keep so many of us up at night. So that's what my seminar is going to be. We're going to look at public opinion. We're going to look at advocacy and lobbying. How is it that something like the Green New Deal or Medicare for All or reforming Wall Street or the Credit Card Act or reforming uh, criminal justice sentencing and the First Step Act, how do those go from a white paper, a dream, a Twitter feed into the halls of power and into law? And let me just say, uh, before Enrique, you go uh, next, that um, when we describe politics, uh, we describe it very, very broadly. Okay, It's not just about running for public office or being involved in campaigns, but about the whole array of things that you can do in the public space that impact on the direction of communities, our country, and, and the world. And, Activism is one of those things. Uh, there are, you know, there, one of the ways in which we move um, a public agenda forward, and that's why I'm so uh, thrilled to have uh, Heather here. The uh, another element of uh, of politics writ large, of making a difference in the public space, is journalism. We don't have a journalism program here at the University of Chicago, but I'm a former journalist. Uh, and uh, I think it's such an integral part of um, shining a bright light in places where lights are needed uh, in our society. And we have two very fine journalists here as well, and you'll hear from them uh, next. Um, like David, I was brought up through print, um, a thing that you guys don't know nothing about. <laughs> yes. just an, there are these things called newspapers. newspapers, newspapers and, where you, um, now, I just, just for, for a second before I introduce myself, I, I really want you to be conscious and, and present of, of the moment you're in. Uh, you know, today, Wednesday, October 2nd, 2019, um, at 5.35 in the evening, there's nothing more important going on in life than this moment right now. And, and I don't mean meeting the fellows at the IOP. <laughs> uh, certainly, <laughs> that's not what I wanted to this say. This is about to be the greatest, <laughs> <laughs> the greatest introduction you've ever heard. <laughs> no, but being at school at, at such a consequential time in, in, our, in our nation, um, and I say our nation, I just became a citizen last week. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you. No, and really, it's, it's such, I have two sons, and I'm trying to find a way. They're two, two years old and a month old, so I'm not giving them any, <laughs> any speeches yet. But I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to talk to them in a way that they, they appreciate experience, because there's no substitute for experience in life. I've come to realize that I'm 41 years old. And I hope that our experiences can sort of be helpful to whatever you're going through in life, personally, professionally, academically. Um, I think that's the most important uh, part of what we're going to be doing in the next uh, few months here. Uh, being at school, being at this university, it's an incredible privilege. You guys are going to be changing the world. Make no mistake about it in the next 
uh, decade, or it's probably sooner than that. And, and I really hope that you take full advantage of that position while you're here. Uh, and I hope that we can be, uh, again, of value in, in, in that endeavor. Um, I'm, a, I'm a journalist. I was brought up through print. I've been doing this for 17 years now. I'm a Mexican immigrant and a journalist, so I check all the uh, you know, <laughs> boxes on President Trump's uh, um, <laughs> enemy of the people, rapist, uh, criminal agenda. But, but no, being, being, uh, going beyond that, I think it's, it's just um, important that we talk about Latinx community in, 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 in the election in 2020. Uh, I want to talk about all the misconceptions that there are around Latinx uh, uh, people in, in, in the U.S., um, the fact that you know, they're all Democrat, that they're all, uh, they only care about immigration, that they are you know, um, this or that. It's, it's not a monolithic community. Different experiences, different interests. They're going to be the swing vote in, in the most important states, states like Florida, just to mention one. And, and it's important that we have a conversation about that and that we understand that. Because I often get to sit down with heads of state, presidents, uh, you know, uh, uh, senators and, and people who are at a point where, where I can, you know, make, I can't really make a difference in how they think about Latinx. But, but you're going to be so much more culturally competent to understand this important community. And I, and I hope that um, we can have that conversation in the next uh, few weeks. Um, I, it, talk about. How long have you been at Fox? Uh, <laughs> I have been at Vox for two years now. Um, and I was just thinking about, talk about, a diverse and strange community. I write about conservatives and conservatism <laughs> and movement conservatism and the Republican Party and the right and how all of those things are actually different things from each other and how conservatism is perhaps the most, I think conservatives would say that they are the most misunderstood political identity and I think that there are a lot of people who are saying, no they are not. Um, I got into this. I, I was never really in print. Um, I graduated from college in the midst of a recession. I started out writing about sports at night while writing about being a speechwriter and working in PR during the day. So if you ever want to talk in my office hours about how to get into journalism without going to journalism school, I know a lot about that. <laughs> and it involves getting really good at Twitter. Um, it probably shouldn't involve getting really good mm -hmm. at Twitter, but that's neither here nor there. Um, I am fascinated by ideas, and specifically the ideas behind conservatism. And I think that, you know, sometimes you hear people talk about, like, why don't we talk about ideas anymore? Well, let's do it. Let's talk about the ideas that are in, uh, supposed to be undergirding what conservatism even is. Ideas that conservatives, you know, I talk to people all the time who are like, actually, we don't know what conservatism is either. Uh, it is, diff you know, conservatism is difficult to sell to people. We don't know how to deal with that either. Conservatives spend a lot of time yelling at other conservatives about whether or not they're not conservative enough or too conservative, or they're rhinos, or they're too far right, or too far left, or left-leaning, or too libertarian, or post-liberal. And I've just used a lot of words, and that's all they do, It's just yell at each other. But we don't have to. We can have these conversations and ask the big questions, like, what is conservatism? Is Donald Trump a conservative? Does that matter? What would that mean if he was? What does it mean if he isn't? What does conservatism and the Republican Party have to do with each other? Are they the same thing? Are they not? And you know, I'm really excited to talk to you guys in office hours or in my seminars about these questions, because they're things that I think about all the time when I'm not thinking about football or Twitter or the Great British Bake Off. So I, I'm really excited. Please come to my office hours. Um, I'm. I think that these are conversations that are important. Whether or not you think of yourself as being on the right side of any political debate, um, I think that these are conversations that matter even if you don't think of yourselves as being a Republican, or very much so even if you do. I think that these are conversations that a lot of times people are afraid to have on the internet, because why would you do that? I think that these are conversations that a lot of you might be kind of nervous to have in person with people because you're worried that it's going to come across in the wrong way or you're just going to get yelled at or you heard that maybe this is going to end up being filmed for something and show up on TikTok later. I think that you know it's time to have these conversations and I'm really hopeful that my seminar can be a place where we can do that. 
and talk about University of Michigan football. Yep, that's uh, actually I what the summit is about. I want to know at the end of this quarter how you think the uh, University of Chicago Maroons compare. Well. <laughs> anyway. You so this is where the, the first ten. Heisman Trophy winner was from the University of Chicago. I know, and then you sold your stick to Michigan State University and doomed us all. And built a library where the stadium was. What is that? I know. Anyway. <laughs> Joe Donnelly, Tom Rooney. You know, I said that this isn't just about running for public office or uh, helping people run for public office. But I also don't want to minimize the, uh, the role that people who we elect to public office play in governance or, um, uh, you know, the, the, the sacrifices and the effort that goes into make it to, to doing that. And uh, I'm so pleased to have uh, these two exemplary people from different parties who are here uh, to share their perspective. And Joe, thank you. you and if you were. I will start out by saying that our tour guide of the university. I, I live in South Bend, Indiana. I have never been on the campus before in my entire life, <laughs> amazingly, not too far away. I've been up and down the Lake Michigan shoreline over here, over by the Museum How of Science and Industry. How about your education? How about that, huh? Yeah. So our tour guide looked and said, I want everybody on our tour to know that the University of Chicago is 1-0 against Notre Dame in football at this point. So I invited all of you to come next week, and we'll play the University of Chicago, <laughs> and we'll have an awesome time. Um, I had um, an unbelievable privilege to serve three terms in the House of Representatives in the state of Indiana, and a term in the United States Senate in the state of Indiana, in really very significantly Republican districts. But the chance to serve, and serve in a way that um, it reflected the people I represented, but also reflected the fact that they had given me the chance to use my best judgment. And, and that's what I want to talk about is how you do that um, in this world today where everything is so torn apart. Because they did that, they gave me uh, the opportunity and something we worked very closely with David on at the time um, to be able to cast a vote on the Affordable Care Act. I happened to be the representative at the time. And uh, the result is, 20 million more Americans um, were able to get health care. That for our young men and women in um, Iraq and in Afghanistan, our state, um, those of you who are from Indiana know, and, and Illinois is very much the same, where uh, served at almost uh, the largest per capita National Guard in the country. And so in my first eight months in the House, we lost eight young men four times the national average. So it's, how do you fix these things? How do you work across the aisle with folks like Tom to try to look and go, what are the things we can agree on? And by agreeing on these things, we can move policy forward. And so uh, I want to talk about how we can work together in a time when it seems you can never work together to actually get things done, big things done, like health care. Big things done, like most all of our young men and women are home from Iraq and Afghanistan. And so um, they're able to celebrate their birthday with their family, as opposed to being in a mountain outpost um, in Coast Province near, Af near Pakistan. And, and how do we solve the big problems that we have? Things like the debt, that guess what? You're the ones who bear the burden of that. It's $22 trillion right now. Our payment is about $400 billion a year just on interest. Think of this. On Alzheimer's last year, a, a, a disease that has caused so many lives, caused so much damage, and the United States is a leader in the world on research. We spent $5 billion on research, and we spent $400 billion on interest. If you flip those two around, we probably have a cure by the end of the year. And so how do we make good decisions in our country? How do we make sure that as we move forward, the decisions we make um, aren't just the easy and convenient ones, but the right ones. The easy and convenient is what we're doing right now. We're cutting taxes and spending more. If you do that in your personal life, your ATM doesn't work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they just go, thank you for stopping by. You have zero money left in your account. And so those are the kind of things we want to work together on to try to figure out how do we bridge this gap, this gap where 
Um, they say, well, you served in a red state. But you know what? By being there, I had the chance to work with some of the most wonderful people in the world who are focused and devoted to our country. And at the same time, they put some trust in me to try to make the best decisions that I thought made the most sense. And so how can we, how can we expand on that across our nation to try to make the decisions that can have another American century ahead? I, I want to echo uh, a lot of what Joe said. I got to have my first seminar today. By the way, how many of you all are first years in this room? So a lot of people just start in college for the first time. Uh, you know, and coming to a school like this, obviously, you're extremely bright and you're at the top of the top. So how many are extremely bright and the top of the top? <laughs> I know that they're brighter than me. Um, they were bright enough not to raise their hands. I, I have to say that walking around campus today, I, I felt like and, and I'm sure all of us felt like we don't feel that far removed from being in the seat that you're sitting in. And yet we've we've been blessed enough or lucky enough or smart enough or whatever to be able to try to do things that we love and, and make a difference. And I think it's a real testament to, to David, this program, and you all for being here to try to um, you know start your career off in college the right way. And uh, I hope you all come to see some of my seminars. We're going to be talking about some of the things. What What is a conservative? I've been called a rhino. I've been called a Trump stooge. I've been called everything under the book. I don't know what I am. So maybe I need to come to your so, yeah, seminar. Yeah, we can um, figure it out together. Help, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, uh, <laughs> and, and we're going to talk about a lot of other, if, if you're interested in running for Congress someday, we're going to have a whole day on what it takes to win or what I think it takes to win. Um, and everything else, I'm going to have some great guests. I'm going to have uh, a reporter from Politico talk about fake news. I'm going to have, uh, m hopefully, my friend Trey Gowdy, who was the other lead investigator for the uh, Russia investigation, join us. And uh, I'm going to have Adam Kinzinger, um, who's from Illinois, come in uh, and talk about war powers and defense spending and, and what that looks like. So I'm excited. I'm, I'm happy that you asked me to yeah. be part of it. We should also point out you're, a, uh, you're, still, you're not active duty now. You're a veteran. I, I served uh, four and a half years on active duty in the Army, as did my wife. So we were yeah. really cool. You know, before children, we actually made a little bit of money doing that. But um, no, it was a great honor. Um, let me just, I just want to ask a few quick questions and then open up the floor. There are these, there are tensions. There are tensions within parties, and uh, there are tensions within our country. And I'm just going to try and uh, touch touch on a few, but you raise an interesting point, which is you considered yourself a conservative. You consider yourself a conservative. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. And how do you define it? I know you were joking about it, but you, I, you obviously. I defined it in, in the way that I think I was brought up in, you know, in kind of the mantra of Ronald Reagan of, you know, the whole trying to keep spending under control keeping taxes low, strong defense, uh, more personal liberties, personal freedoms, and um, you know everything else sort of falling in place with that. But what, when I got to Congress, um, especially in 2010, now I got elected with President Obama in 08, so we were in the minority. Actually, those two years were the easiest two years I served in Congress. <laughs> we're in the minority. Literally, it was just, you know, we're the loyal opposition. It was easy. Yeah. Could have left it that way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, the Tea Party came in in 2010, and then all of a sudden what it meant to be a conservative was a lot of times based and judged upon what certain think tanks in Washington said a scorecard would give you to see how conservative you are. Mm -hmm. The problem with that, and a lot of it had to do with spending, you have to go home, and my district was very agricultural, and um, we had farm bills to do. We had subsidies. We had federal government <laughs> programs, which if you supported any of them, you scored uh, an F on your report card for these think tanks, these Washington conservative think tanks, and then all of a sudden you're a rhino. And I'm thinking to myself, am I a rhino? Like, you know, <laughs> am, am, I, am I like a moderate or am I not even a Republican? And, 
you know, and I think about the reasons why I became a Republican when I was your age, because I didn't really didn't even know when I was in college. Mm -hmm. And then um, and then it went from that, these scorecards, Heritage Action, Club for Growth, all these scorecards about how conservative was conservative. And then Trump gets elected. And places like Club for Growth that made their money off of free trade now all of a sudden are like backtracking on things like free trade because Trump wants to, you know, do tariffs and those type of things. So now the measure of whether or not you're a real Republican is, I think, in large part, how loyal you are to our president. And um, do you consider him a conservative? I don't. Um, I think that I think that he's a populist, and I think that he, um, you know, there's some some things that obviously he would probably side more on the Republican side with, but there's some things like trade and uh, a lot of other things I've had to like sort of look back and say, you know, th this this from the time of Reagan to Jack Kemp to Paul Ryan has always been a tenant of our platform, and now all of a sudden just because of a tweet, it's not. And so, you know, who are we? And actually, one of my seminars is on that. So, so is he a conservative by modern Republican standards? <laughs> well, I think that that's the real challenge, is that, again, the idea of what a conservative is is largely shaped by, in some senses, like you brought up Reagan, where, you know, for we are now 30 years removed from Reagan leaving office, and how much of a hold the concept of Reagan holds on conservatism is still kind of up for debate. And I think even people in, you see in the 1970s, how people thought about Reagan, who had been the <coughs> governor of California. He had signed, you know, it's funny going back now, because he had signed an op uh, open carry ban in the state of California, basically aimed at the Black Panthers, because black people open carrying guns seems to make people change their minds about open carry for some <laughs> reason. But it's interesting, because even Reagan himself had to deal with the idea of, like, not being adequately conservative enough. And you see that um, in the early d days of his tenure, 1981, 1982, He's getting a lot of pushback from the right of people like he's not conservative enough, or this idea of what it means to be a real conservative. And this is a debate that's been going on in conservatism for 60 years. You know, William F. Buckley, who founded National Review, he had this moment of essentially having to purge the conservative movement, which was small enough at that point at kind of the elite levels that you could do, he, one person could do this. And one of the groups he wound up purging is the John Birch Society, which was rabidly anti-communist and convinced that everyone, including Dwight D. Eisenhower, was a communist. And I wrote a piece for the New York Times Opinion, um, or New York Times Magazine on conservatism. And he got all these letters saying, like, I thought you were a real conservative, but now I see you're just a rhino, pinko commie. And basically saying that William F. Buckley isn't conservative enough. And so it really is staunch. It's very, de very much determined by the era. And even our idea of, you know, kind of the Paul Ryan style conservative, which was, you know, if you went to Club for Growth or AEI, where he's now, uh, I believe, a fellow, you know, you see a lot of people like, oh, that's what conservatism looks like. But I think one of the challenges, I had a conversation for a podcast. I do the Ezra Klein, my sort of, he's not my boss, but he's ish my boss. Um, we, I had a conversation for his podcast with Matthew Continetti, who was a founder of the Washington Free Beacon and pretty big in conservative circles, where I was like, well, you know, what is conservatism? He's like, we, we don't know. We really just don't know. And it's really hard to sell people on it. Because I think, you know, what you brought up, kind of the idea of limited government and personal liberty, you're starting to see people now who are like, but what if people have the liberty and then do things we don't like? What do we do then? And that's when you see, um, I don't know, the New York, uh, New York Post opinion editor, uh, Sora Bamari, has been writing all this stuff about how, you know, we need a post-liberal mo mo moment where everything should be shaped by the highest good. And what does he mean by the highest good? Who gets to decide? Who, what is freedom anyway? What if you use your freedom to download pornography or be in a same-sex marriage, things that people don't sometimes want you to do? Those questions have been around in conservatism for a really long time. And they've been, you know, who gets to be the real conservative has been very time and situation dependent. Yeah. There are, I mean, but as I hear you talk, 
um, the things that defined the Republican Party during the Reagan era, uh, free trade, you know, the, the budget issue, although... Immigration, David. Immigration, yeah. yes. Uh, Reagan signed what uh, some conservatives complained was amnesty. Was, yeah. was, was amnesty. But, but uh, you know, it seems like some of the basic tenets that were a mantra for Republicans are completely antithetical mm. to, uh, to Trumpism. Heather, mm. I was wondering what you were thinking when Joe was speaking because the tension within the Democratic Party is between... No, we don't have any tension. The, the left. <laughs> That's sort of part of the definition of being a Democrat. But it w was between um, all this energy on the left yeah. for big solutions. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, the argument that um, in a democracy, it's hard to get really big things done and you've got to get done as much as you can get right. done, which is a frustrating answer mm -hmm. for people, especially with burgeoning problems like climate change, right. like uh, inequality, and so on. Yeah. So where is, the, where, where is this all going uh, within the Democratic Party? And, and, you know, in a few words. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that there have been, generally speaking, politics advances incrementally which doesn't mean that you don't have big ideas, assert big ideas, and fight like hell for big ideas. It just means that you, in the end, have to compromise and you end up with incremental change, right? Which is a, a big distinction um, from, like, going out there trying to sell and fight for incremental change. Um, but there have been moments in American history and in the history, you know, of all great societies where there have been tectonic shifts in how everyday people experience life that have blown open the window for bigger change. And I think without those, we, we wouldn't be the society we are. Government wouldn't work, right? If it was just moving at the pace of compromise all the time, particularly when the compromise betwe is between poles that are not set by popular opinion, but that are set often by beltway conventional wisdom, which is often set by lobbying and the influence of money. And often wrong. <laughs> and often wrong, and often yeah. profoundly wrong, and not reflective of the base of their parties. Um, without <coughs> those big moments, I, I think government, you know, wouldn't be, wouldn't work. And so the New Deal is one of those moments. Um, the, the massive realignment after um, LBJ signed the Civil Rights Act in our politics is another one of those moments on the other side. And I think the financial crisis, um, which still has scars absolutely for your generation and across this country's landscape, is one of those moments as well. Um, and I think we are in many ways still in an economic moment where what could be done because of what the financial crisis revealed is not yet finished. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you hear this demand for big solutions, because we are still behind on wealth, on security. <laughs> um, and in that landscape of economic inequality and insecurity, um, there's still a yearning for something much bigger. Um, yeah, and I don't want to go all Yang Gang on you, <laughs> but uh, there is... Uh, I mean, I don't think we have fully reconciled with the uh, impact of technology yeah. and the warp speed at which it's changing yeah. our economy, changing the way we communicate, changing everything in, so quickly that we can't get <laughs> our arms around it. Yeah. Uh, and I think that it, it's disappointing to me, frankly, that he is really the only one out there right. talking about this now, and it seems to me like a fundamental uh, question for yeah. us. It is fundamental. Um, and I think that, you know, the we who hasn't gotten their arms around it is an interesting question, right? Because government hasn't, right? There are many, there's another government, which is Silicon Valley, which is very much feels a lot of agency and power over where things are going. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. Except I Except they don't have elections. Except they absolutely are not elected um, and, and they're not accountable um, even to necessarily their customers. Um, so, yeah, we could say a lot more about that. Yeah, but. Well, I, I don't want to take us down <laughs> too many, uh, down because I, I do want to get to some uh, questions. Joe, um, <coughs> you talked about, Heather was talking about these big moments, and there was a big moment in 2009, uh, and a lot was done, a lot of progressive legislation was passed, the Affordable Care Act, the financial reform, each of which could have been more. 
uh, perhaps from the standpoint of progressives, but uh, and 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 a, and a host of other things. But uh, I also remember that uh, there were times during those two years when there were 60 Democrats in the Senate, right. uh, an overwhelming majority of Democrats in the House, as there were in these the other epics. The 60s is a little more complicated, right. um, but. Um, uh, is it possible? Is it possible to get big things done in a Congress that is v deeply divided uh, and closely divided on a uh, on a partisan basis? If a Congress is closely divided for big, big things, um, well, take the Senate right now. Take the Senate right now. I don't think there's been. Maybe a little around the edges, but other than judges, think of this. Um, my last date in the Senate was around January 6th, somewhere around there. Um, since that time, nothing, mm -hmm. zero. Mm -hmm. Like an entire year has passed, mm -hmm. and some judges have been um, put into office, but other than that, nothing. And a, when you have a Senate majority leader who takes great pride in the fact that he goes around and tells everybody, my nickname is the Grim Reaper, and my job is to kill socialist legislation. Well, socialist legislation, in effect, is whatever he doesn't like. Um, you know, it's a, it's a term of art that can be determined um, differently. But Grim Reaper is good day. with Halloween coming up. It is very good, yes. But so that's where we are <laughs> when you talk about um, the big, big stuff. We, we were able to get health care passed in 2010. Big stuff. And in, it, it, to give you an idea, in 2008, I won my election by 37 points in, in a district that leaned Republican by about seven points. In 2010, I vote for the health care bill. I win that election by one point. And so, um, it was tremendously good legislation, and I knew it was. And I said, look, the people have given me the chance to vote on this. But I also knew this is, this is going to cause trouble because it was a lot of change and a lot <laughs> piled into one thing. And what was interesting was, you know, for want of a better word, uh, the most progressive Democrats in the district I lived in screamed and yelled at me because I did not include a public option in the yeah. legislation. Yeah. So I'm like, we won by like one vote. You know, actually it was three because nobody wanted to be the one. So it was 219 to 216, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's basically, there's a tattoo on my back, I think, that says that. <laughs> but they all screamed, why didn't you get the public option? And the answer is because it would have been 300 votes against it if you had the public option. So we got that done. And now we're at a moment where if the public option came up, now everybody's ready for the public option. Mm -hmm. And so can you get big things done in this Senate? No, because the things the House wants are different than what the Senate wants at this point. And you can't reconcile those. And if you pass some legislation that you both think is good, the president will veto it. And so that's the big challenge that we have. The one thing we were able to get done was some right to, it was called right to try legislation last year. And what that was, was uh, legislation that allowed people in serious medical conditions mm -hmm. to get their medications after phase one. We had no votes for it in the Senate. But Ron Johnson had a patient with ALS from Wisconsin. He's from Wisconsin. I had a young boy with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy who at the age of 21, it's expected uh, you're, you're, you're gone at that point. But we did it the old-fashioned way. We work, we call member after member after member after member. And after explaining it, they said, this is something we can do. So we wound up with 100 to nothing. I, I think actually on these, on these health issues, yeah. like on those kind of issues, you can find a lot more bipartisan right. uh, uh, consensus. Enrique, uh, the, you talked, and I don't want to... I guess everybody's sort of previewing some of their stuff, but I, uh, so I don't want you to kind of tip your mitt on everything here, <laughs> but you did open up the door there when you said that the, uh, uh, that the Latinx vote is misunderstood 
And, you know, in poll after poll, there's a, there's a solid quarter, 30 percent of, of a vote for, for Trump. Well, we're going to have a, a, a seminar dedicated to, to polls and Latinos because I think uh, a lot of the exit polls that got it wrong on the election in 2016 are the ones that we're using to explain the Latino vote. So if we're not trusting those votes to be accurate in the sense that they, they missed some important points. Do you think, well, well, what, what well, is the deeper truth without giving away your whole well, deal Well, the deeper there? truth is that, yes, uh, more and more Latinos are becoming conservative, Latinx, uh, because two-thirds of Latinx are U.S. born. So they are behaving more like the, the general electorate, right? Um, second, third generation that are... Uh, in a way, um, shaped by, by their background, by their immigrant background, but uh, are American in every sense. So they, they behave more politically like the rest of the electorate. So roughly 30% uh, define themselves as, as conservatives uh, and a large portion of them as pro-Trump. Uh, uh, also, again, it's not a monolithic community, so Cuban-Americans in Florida yes. behave very differently than Mexican-Americans here in Chicago, for example. Um, That's where Senator Scott... Uh, I mean, it wasn't just them, but, you, you know, the, the Republican vote for the Republican candidates in 2018, I think we're somewhere close to half Correct. in Florida. And, and, and it was a crucial vote in getting Florida um, to, to vote for Trump in 2016. Uh, I think it's going to be a crucial vote in getting Texas to turn blue as quickly as 2020. Um, we're going to dedicate a whole seminar to that. Uh, we're going to bring in uh, a, a guy at the front line of that um, uh, fight, and it's extremely interesting to see, for example, not just this discussion at a presidential politics level, but to see how local officials uh, are really changing uh, the, the face of uh, political representation in Texas. You have Lina Hidalgo, a, a Colombian immigrant. She's, I think, 27 years old. She's the uh, Judge County, Harris County. Yeah. Harris County is... Uh, the largest county in Texas. She over, uh, oversees a budget of $5 billion, 6 million people. It's Houston and, and, and a lot of other cities. And, and she's a Democrat. She's the first woman to ever hold that position, uh, a Latinx. The, uh, so, so it's an interesting uh, trend that we're seeing in local politics in, in, mm -hmm. in a place like Texas. So um, that's what I w I'm going to be talking about, how uh, a lot of people think that most Latinx are, con are uh, you know, uh, natural democratic voters when they're really natural conservatives. They like, mm -hmm. they're social conservatives, they lean, you know, family values. <laughs> Most of them are Catholic, um, they're uh, 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 you know, pro-life. Um, some of them, uh, again, same-sex marriage right. and issues like this. So it's, it's, it's really fascinating to go in deep and, 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 and try to educate the next generation of, of uh, you know, people, activists, politicians, <coughs> representatives, uh, about what's become the largest uh, uh, racial minority in our electorate. In 2020, they're going to be uh, surpassing African Americans as the largest uh, uh, racial minority in, in the electorate. So it's important to understand uh, this Latinx vote. It's interesting, though. I would I say. Did. Sorry, I just wanted to. I saw you. Um, yeah, I, I, I saw so you were either adjusting yourself in your chair, or you want to. <laughs> you wanted to say something. Well, to what degree is the? You know, you just said the largest racial minority, but of course, right. it's not, it's a, not race, a racial, right? right? So, I mean, it may be race itself is all just a social <laughs> decision that we make. Um, but if you know, there's a big question about what race many Latinx people will ultimately sort of assign themselves to in the racial hierarchy of our society and um, how, because ra politics is so racialized, right? Like the, the way that people vote, the way that people see the world becomes so filtered through our culture, through the media that targets us, through the messages we are given about who we are versus other people and other groups. And right now, we're at a time of heightened identity politics among people of color and among white people. And so how Latinx people will behave politically, I think, really can be interestingly disaggregated around how they identify racially, mm -hmm. which is a different layer than saying, I speak Spanish at home, or I'm from yeah. um, you know, a part of the Spanish diaspora. True. I would also note that uh, one of my seminars will talk about non-white conservatives, because the same things could be true. There are. I'm going to use the term conservative here, but I want to be clear that there's like big C movement conservative and then there's small C conservative, people who 
tend to be more kind of conservative in their thoughts and actions, and yes, sometimes in politics. And a lot of people noted the look at the polling of African American voters and are like, African Americans in general tend to skew more small c conservative on social issues and kind of ideas that for many people are like, they should be automatic big c conservatives. They are not. And you know we're going to get into this, but there's a reason why you know when people talk about Blexit and things like that, and then you look at the polling numbers and just see that between African for African American Do people know what Blexit is. Please, oh, it's <sighs> University of Chicago. Anyway, uh, like the polling numbers for Trump among African Americans, he's somewhere his approval rating is somewhere between two percent and eight percent. And so I think that there is a fascinating connection there, because I think there's a long history of African-American conservatives in the United States. Um, and there's also been a long history of African-American conservatives fighting against the Republican Party. You know, Major League Baseball great Jackie Robinson protested outside the 1964 Republican National Convention, where Barry Goldwater was nominated for president. Someone tried to get into a fight with Jackie Robinson in the arena, which was a very bad idea, and they had to be pulled apart by the person's wife. You know, there's a history to this that I think is really interesting as to, you know, people are like, you, I, there's the famous GOP autopsy document from after the mm -hmm. 2012 election. Which has been buried. Oh, buried. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I feel like I think I talk about that more often than the people who wrote it do. No, of yeah, course. No, no, it's just... um, but this idea of like, well, we could reach out to what they talked about kind of being natural constituencies and non-white communities of like religious African Americans, specifically African Americans who follow either kind of mainline Protestantism within the Christian community, or are themselves, think of themselves as being evangelical. Or, you know, they outreach in African American communities more broadly. And then, then they just didn't do it. And so there's, you know, there are a lot of African Americans who I think would think of themselves as being conservative if conservative didn't mean what it does to them. And I think no. that's something I'm going to get into in one of my lectures, because I think, uh, in one of my seminars, because I think the story of non-white conservatives in the United States really tells us a lot about movement conservatism and the GOP more broadly. Yeah, I mean, these discussions, I think, are so, ri uh, are so rich um, by race, by region, and by culture. And um, there's, there's a lot to unpack. Uh, Tom, um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention there's a story right now um, <laughs> about impeachment. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a lot of it is sort of in your legislative experience and, and wheelhouse. Um, uh, and I was wondering what you, what you, and there are others here who could probably speak to this. How do you see this thing unfolding here? Well, Tell us we, what's going to happen, man. I, I can't believe I'm and, and when, that. if you can. <laughs> keep, stop zooming in on me, please. <laughs> yes. If we uh, put a bag over your head, can you give us the answer? I don't feel like I'm that fat, but you know, there it is. Put, uh, the, put the thinning <laughs> lens on, please. <laughs> we talked about this today a little bit. Um, you know, I always sort of look at talk to some of my former constituents and some of my family members that are Trump loyalists and you know immediately after something like this happens and try to gauge where they think and then look at what Republicans in the House are doing and, and in the Senate and it wasn't 24 hours after that that it, it looked clearly like the Republicans were circling the wagons the talking point was no quid pro quo and there was fundraising emails going out to protect the president. Help me, help me defend the president. So you knew right there that it's become political. And it wasn't going to be one of these Nixon moments where Republicans were going down to the White House being like, this is really bad. This isn't like before. So it has become another in a series of events where I, I, I talked about this a little bit today. The president seems to always keep his powder just enough dry with what he said in that, um, in that phone call to where President Zelensky says, I want this defense capability, these javelins. And President Trump pivots and says, well, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to look into our vice president. He where, said, I want, I want you to do me a favor, though. Though. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> so That's a heavy though. <laughs> so I ask my constituents and I ask people that I know are Trump lawyers, what do you think about this? Well, you should tell, you say looking into a former government official, I think it's completely appropriate for the president to say, you know, if one of our former officials was doing something improper. Um, so immediately, the talking points of whatever medium they were looking at were being regurgitated. And I, and I almost wanted to say, what exactly would it take mm. in this situation? What, were the, what would the words need to be? And I think I sort of figured it out. If, if you give me <laughs> dirt on my opponent in my election, I will then give you taxpayer dollars from the United States for your defense things. It has to be that clear to be a quid pro quo where everybody would be understand that that's not good. And even then, I'm not sure, but the a little bit of wiggle room that it could say, because the Republican talking point the next day was no quid pro quo. They circled the wagons around that talking point, and you knew from there that they were saying, well, th that, that's not what he was saying. And so um, you asked me where I think it's going to go. I, I mean, I, I don't know what the speaker is going to do in the House, but I just, I have reservations that we're going to get into the next election, and Mitch, Mitch is going to have his members trying to prosecute that case. And if it just were, don't see it getting that far. If it were a, a secret ballot, <coughs> the secret ballot being like the actual vote, mm -hmm. the vote in the Senate, in the House, would there be significantly more Republicans? I don't know. So um, uh, this is the last point, and then I want to open it up to questions. Um, I, I'm probably the old, only uh, one in this room who is old enough to remember Watergate, um, but I'll share the benefit of my <laughs> long experience. There was no, I was a student here when it was going on, there was no Fox News then. Mm -hmm. There was no Breitbart. There was no social media. I'm not at all sure that Richard Nixon would have resigned or that those folks would have taken the walk down Pennsylvania Avenue um, mm. if they faced the kind of pressures that you are well aware of on the beat that you cover. Um, so it is interesting. There were a couple, you know, if you go back to like 1972, uh, early 1973, there are a number of Republican senators who sound very much like Lindsey Graham now, of basically being like, whatever it was, I'm sure it's fine. I will always defend Nixon. This is just a witch hunt. They're just coming after him because he won an election fair and square, especially because the, the win in 72 was so overwhelming. Yes. And there was just like, you're just mad that he won. You can't get over losing in 72. Like, this is just what losers do. And it's interesting how that's reflected. Obviously, like, a lot of things changed as more information was well, revealed. Well, in fact, the tape surfaced the fact with the, tape, the yeah. president. Uh, in, in, in incriminating himself. But I do think the environment was much, much different, uh, and I think media has a lot to do with it. In any case, questions? Oh, there's a mic. So the person with the mic is going to choose the questioner so as not to make you mad at us. Go ahead. Senator Donnelly and Congressman Rooney. Rooney. Like Public Wayne. I used to say like Mickey, but nobody knows who that is. Aww. Public service is ostensibly a critical element of Congress. Um, it seems to me, as I'm sure it seems to many people outside the system, that that element has been lost. What is the path back to public service in the halls of Congress? Well, I, I don't think it has been lost. Um, I think that the people who are serving, um, you know, as, as unpopular as it may seem sometimes to say, sacrifice a lot. Look, um, you know, Tom had little kids when he started. And uh, I'll, ne I'll, I'll never forget my first year, you know, being in the district I was in, 2007. Um, you look up and you go, well, uh, one of the reporters was asked, you know, what recommendation would you make to Senator Donnelly or to Congressman Donnelly at the time? And he said, tell him, to, tell him not to buy, to rent, because he may not be around very long. <laughs> um, so my first day, I didn't work. 
was Thanksgiving Day. So I worked like 200 and something days in a row because I love this country. I mean, and I'm not exceptional. That's what Tom does too. And so we do this job because we love our nation, because we love our country. It wasn't to get rich or to get money or this or that, because there's plenty of easier ways to do it. But it's because, look, and, and we're nothing compared to like our dads and moms. Um, my father-in-law fought on Guadalcanal in Bougainville in World War II, and then came back and raised a family, and his wife was in the waves. My dad was in the Navy during World War II. And so um, I really do believe that uh, most all the people who do it do it for the right reasons. I may think they're crazy, but um, y you know they're crazy, but they're still doing it for the right reasons. And so um, I, I have significant faith in, in a whole bunch of the people that I serve with. The, the senators I know, the House members that I know, uh, I can't think of better friends to have. and and people who would have my back in return. I may disagree with them 100% on policy, but I really think highly of them. I would just add, how many of you all have heard of either me or Joe before you came here tonight? Really? Well, there, forget it. I, I was going to say none of you have probably heard of us because, you know, I, I very rarely went on television. Uh, you know, I wasn't one of the so-called talking heads. I mean, I, I like to think that my work was done in my committees and at, at home in my district. It, it didn't take me long to figure out that I wasn't going to get famous being a congressman. But some people do go to Washington to get famous. And they'll say whatever it takes to get famous. Um, uh, a lot of times on our side of the aisle was people that would go against, you know, people on our side of the aisle was like a quick way to shoot to, to fame going after Boehner or Ryan, you know. So uh, the, the two chief rhinos of our party would get them famous. But, um, you know, I think, that, I think that it's just what Joe said. Public service to me quickly, I realized that as much as I could do for my district would be the best way for me to get reelected, despite the fact of my score with these groups of whether I was conservative or not. I always did very well on election day because I worked for my district. And, um, I would say a lot of the people that were in Washington that we served with thought the same way. One of the reasons I left, because it was very frustrating not to be able to get a lot of the things done I wanted to get done. Um, but, um, you know, you see, you tend to see the same 20 people on TV all the time. <laughs> and uh, there's, you know, 405 other of us left, if you count the Senate, another 100. So. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of people up there that are trying to do the right thing. So uh, let me just say, I appreciate what both you guys said, and I, I, I have great reverence for public service, um, and I saw actually people sat, uh, you know, do what is rare in Washington and, and sacrifice their careers uh, on that Affordable Care Act vote, oh, yeah. uh, and I'm deeply grateful uh, for that, having been involved in it and knowing what it meant to people. Um, that said, there is an impression, and it's not entirely wrong, that we live in an era <coughs> when too often the parties uh, uh, and, you know, weaponize problems rather than solve them uh, in order to facilitate re-election, holding on to power, and um, that's created an enormous amount of cynicism. I mean, Congress's ratings are abysmal. Oh, yeah. And um, I do think that, you know, the amount of time that you have to spend raising money uh, and um, the, uh, you know, so th there are a lot of obstacles to, there are a lot of things that happen below the surface that are very much <coughs> meaningful and you can every day make a small impact in people's lives but there are also there are there are these big problems that go unresolved and um, and uh, and so there is this cynicism um, and part of it is what you talked about which is people who go to be on TV but um, you know and I would point out that uh, Joe, you you were a fine senator, and you lost your seat, and you lost yeah. your seat because at the end of the day, uh, partisanship was more meaningful. Uh, 
Right. And so there's a, there are a lot of concerns, and we ought to be frank about those concerns, about the problems in our, in our system, uh, because um, we ought to try and address them and improve the system. Right. So anyway, more questions? Hi. Um, something that seems to be quite a big dividing issue in the 2020 election are reparations. So I'd love to hear each of your opinions on policies surrounding reparations. Kind of a <laughs> big question to ask all of you. But. Yeah, man. Sure. You <laughs> cancel your evenings. <laughs> There's a sign reading under your chairs. We're gonna, um, uh, I won't say a lot about this except to say that I think um, it's a good conversation to have. I also think that we it's allowing us to talk about the racial wealth gap in this country, um, which is truly just the most obvious impact of uh, of the legacy of slavery and, more importantly, discrimination in our wealth-building enterprises, right? The mortgage market, where you live, how you're able to save and get a pension um, throughout, throughout the 20th century and well into the 21st. Um, most importantly, if I could do one thing to the reparations debate, I would make sure that we were really talking not just about slavery, but about the 20th century and about the legalized, enforced by violence and enforced by the law, ways that every single way that white families have gotten wealth. And you may be working class, rural, and have an income of $12,000 a year. You may be a high school dropout and a white person. And you have an average amount of wealth that's the same as a black person who's gone to graduate school. It's not about income. It's not about education. It's about the laws that decided whether or not your mother, your grandparents could own property, or whether or not that property had in it a contract clause that said that they couldn't sell, couldn't sell to African Americans, or whether there was a line around your neighborhood that the government drew to say no bank can issue a mortgage in this area and still get the backing of the federal government. These were the decisions that we were making in many ways up until the 1980s. And so the reparations conversation has to be rooted in how people actually build wealth in this country, which is housing. And it has to be really about the decisions that weren't made by you know, people who had their S's as F's. And we don't really think of them as you know, anybody that anybody knows, but people who many of them are still in office, still making money today. Yeah, I think that the structural issues that are still affecting people's lives today, it's the best approach to talking about reparations. You, you know, I walk into juveniles, uh, like the, 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 basically detention centers for minors in this country, and they're full of African-American and Latino kids. Um, and, and there's a structural issue in our justice system that is allowing for this, and it's uh, you know, perpetuating this cycle of, um, of um, injustice. So, um, I, I agree. I think we have to look at it from, from how we change things structurally today to approach this conversation about our past and, and about reparations. Yeah, I think um, it's interesting because I think that this conversation, it so easily just becomes about slavery when, you know, 100 years ago this past summer, Red Summer in Chicago was some of the worst race riots. And by race riots, and that's, I mean gangs of white people attempting to kill black people that we've ever seen in this country. And you may have heard of like the bombing of Black Wall Street, in which individuals in planes that they owned bombed a street in Tulsa that was like the center of black wealth mm -hmm. in that area. And the degree to which it was both governments and communities attempting to keep African Americans specifically out of experiencing wealth. And you know, there have been a lot of arguments, and you see this sometimes in conservative circles, that like segregation was a positive for African Americans because you know they you saw like an expansion of middle class wealth. Well, it wasn't a positive to be purposefully separated and forced to exist outside of you know the circles formed for that created wealth that benefited families that are existing today. You know, I think about my parents, for example, um, a mixed race couple. They got married in 1979. Uh, it 12 years before they got married, um, my parents will be celebrating their 40th wedding anniversary in November, in November of this year. They're delightful people. 
it took it took a Supreme Court ruling, Loving versus Virginia, in 1967, to strike down anti-miscegenation laws um, in the state of Virginia. Which, if you know anything about the Lovings, basically they were a married couple, a white man and a black woman, and the sheriff's op officer broke into their home and charged them with a crime for being married to one another. And that wasn't that long ago. I know it seemed like 1967 seems like a long time ago, but like it really wasn't in the space of American history. And I always find it so funny when the same people are like, ah, oh, remember the founding fathers and the Alamo, or suddenly like, whoa, 1967 was a while ago. I'm like, no. So I think that if we're going to do anything when we're talking about reparations, one, I think that we need to be really specific about how we're talking about this. I think it can get kind of weird when people are like, well, who was descended from slaves anyway, blah, blah, blah. It's not as if the people, you know, I write a lot about white nationalism and um, you know the, the, the alt-right and things like that. And do you know what they don't care about? Whether or not black people were descended from slaves or not. They're not like, oh, you were, you know, oh, you're from the Caribbean. Oh, that's very different. You know, I think that it's worth thinking about reparations through the lens of thinking about how race has been used in this country and used not just against African Americans. We've been having a lot of discussions. Um, there's the Harvard admissions case that, reg re that involves Asian Americans and involves talking about Asian Americans as, as believing that they don't fit personality attributes that Harvard wants. You know, that's, now this is the same Harvard that did very much the same to Jewish American people. And I think that when we're talking about this, I think it's, it's really good to get into the way that race has been specifically used as a cudgel against African Americans, but the way that races and racism have put a lot of people, have a lot of different racial categories in this country, people who emigrated to this country or were born of this country or forced into this country, has put them all in the unenviable position of having to claw their way back to reach equal. So um, I, I want to hear from these guys. I just, I just have two things to say about this. One is, and we had Brian Stevenson here, I think it was it last year? Last year. But um, you know, he was in incredibly impactful. And, and you know, we have a horrible legacy that we've never fully reconciled with in this country. The idea that we, um, that that millions of people were, were 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 kidnapped and, uh, in, you know, and enslaved, uh, and sold into servitude and treated like something less than human. Uh, that we fought a civil war over it, and then. Um, uh, after a brief period of, uh, of reconstruction, uh, that legacy resurfaced in, in, in more muted ways, but pernicious ways. We've never really come to grips with that, and we, ought to, and we have to, as a country, come to grips with that and, 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 how, we, uh, and how we respond to it. And uh, what that means, I think, is something that needs to be, um, that needs to be considered. But it's something we have to do. That said, and I mentioned this to this group earlier, um, we also have to think about how in our society we have this discussion in a way that doesn't create this kind of zero-sum game mentality. Uh, we've got people in this country, um, uh, you know, w we talk about white privilege, um, and it's a real thing. Uh, we have people in this country who, you know, they feel who have been displaced in this economy, who feel culturally estranged, and their their feeling is that they're losing um, that they're losing something. That's the political reality. I would argue that Donald Trump has very much mined this divide, this sense of loss that you feel among, uh, or that those those people feel. So one of my questions is not just how do we reconcile ourselves with this horrible legacy and what do we do about it, but how do we have this conversation, an honest conversation in this country uh, about it um, in a way that is not, again, weaponized for political purposes, but uh, actually moves us forward. So anyway, I'll turn it over to you. Well, I've always thought that the most powerful thing in the world is education. 
And so how do you make it so that that child in Markham or Harvey or Robbins or Blue Island can get the same kind of education as that child in Wilmette or Lake Forest? And when you do that and you create that equality of opportunity, those children have a chance to come to the University of Chicago, have a chance to go to Harvard, have a chance to go to Yale. And so, um, you can throw Notre Dame in there. It's okay. <laughs> well, it's being modest. <laughs> um, that I, I think that is you, what people <clears throat> fear the most. Why did they always take books away? Why did they always try to discourage children from going to school? The the, the people who have who hate the most, who who hung their racist. <clears throat> um, tendencies out there is because they knew the power of reading. They knew the power of education, that it changes everything. And so the more we can do, I think, the, is, is the more we can do to give those children and Harvey and Blue Island and Englewood the same exact education that that child in Wilmette is getting, I think that's a really powerful tool. You know, to answer um, what you said, I don't know if this is politically correct to say or not, but my dad used to say that this country will never stop paying for the sin of slavery. So when you say, how are we going to reconcile what the original question is, you know, he would say, we'll, we'll never reconcile it. I hope that's not true. And I hope when I look out here and I, you know, think about my own sons who are teenagers and the, you know, the way that they think and the society that they're growing up in, Maybe it's better than the ones that, you know, we're growing up in or, or, or whatever. Or, but then, you know, you do talk about Trump and you, you think about making America great again and what that means and, 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 and who that's playing to. And I don't know if that's going the wrong way or um, a dog whistle for something else. But, um, you know, I, I When you, I, say, I you say you don't know like you know. <laughs> <clears throat> well... <laughs> I hope my dad's wrong, but the fact that you're still asking this question and the fact that, you know, um, you know, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and I always thought that we were a lot better than our parents and our grandparents when it came to certain things. And, you know, my dad used to point out things in West Palm Beach that, that you know, that used to be a black bathroom. This used to be, you know, for whites only. And e even in West Palm Beach, you're, you're just sort of like surprised to hear about that. And it wasn't that long, long before, um, you know, I was born that that was going on, the whole loving case. Um, but, you know, I, I would like to think that we keep getting better and that the opportunities that Joe talks about with education, that you're making us better, that you're getting us to that point where, um, you know, that maybe, maybe we, we have moved beyond it, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's 2019 and, you know, we're still getting that question and we're talking about what, you know, our government's doing and um, it, it just makes me sad that we're even still talking about this, but, you know, maybe my dad's right and I hate to, I hate to admit that, but. Uh, and David, if I may, I, I, I asked President Obama about this um, during an interview in 2012, and, and he said that, you know, pretty much what, what it's been said in, in this panel, but uh, that these younger generations, his daughters, hopefully my sons, um, have a much more bold view of these issues. Yeah. And, and we can only hope that that's how incremental change uh, mm -hmm. also, also works in this case. And I'm going to answer with, with two hats here. Uh, first, uh, uh, as an immigrant, I, I grew up across the border in Mexico admiring American democracy. I think, you know, this country achieved so many great things. It cultivated the greatest economy in the world. It has a highly evolved uh, democracy built on these incredible principles of freedom and, 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 and personal, uh, um, uh, you know, rights, uh, individual, right, individual rights. Um, and I think it achieved that because it was an informed society. Basically, um, you know, when right now, with a smartphone, you have access to more information and knowledge than probably what President Obama had when he uh, became president back in 2008. Um, but still, we're living the era of misinformation and propaganda and lies 
and this term of fake news that I, I, I don't like to call it that because if it's fake, it's not news. Um, but, but we achieved all these great things because we were informed as a society, and we're not informed anymore. Um, and, and I think when we talk about how do we move forward with these historical um, issues that, and, and with this discussion is probably well, we take responsibility in informing ourselves better, be, be more responsible for the way we consume information and the way we share information. And, and we do this face to face and not on, on, on Twitter and you know, these platforms that are, are not um, uh, helping at, to have a, a accountability and transparency in this important conversation. I thought you were going to say I grew up admiring American democracy in Mexico and, and now I've become a citizen <laughs> and I'm going to complain just like every other American uh, about it. I, I would, um, just because I know we got time for one more question, I, I would just uh, say um, that um, we, we have definitely made progress in, some, in, in many important ways. But you don't have to stroll too far from the campus of this university to understand what the impact of structural racism has been uh, and the legacy that we're still dealing with. And, um, and honestly, Enrique, uh, you talked about those days when we, you know, we, that we made that progress because people were better informed. But people, but, but um, you mean we made progress as a country when people were better informed, but we didn't make enough progress on that. Mm. And uh, somehow we have to confront that issue. But my only point is that it is a, there's a lot of volatility around this, and it's going to take wisdom uh, and it's going to take sensitivity to lead the country uh, through this discussion mm -hmm. because it, it's easy to exploit as we've seen, um, but it, it, it is hard to solve, and it's going to require uh, an impulse to bring the country uh, along, and it can't be zero-sum politics. I could just say one thing um, to what you just said. What you're going to see over the next year and, year and two months, year and three months, is the president's campaign is really focused on as his, his message, a message of fear and division. And so a subject like that he'll use as a subject for fear and division. And that's always maybe an easier sell than hope and aspiration and what's right. But I truly believe at the end of the day that that's the message that beats the message that's out there now. You're an upbeat guy, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> but, who's, but who's doing that? What? Who's doing that? Yeah. Um, my question's uh, primarily for the two congressmen. Um, first of all, thank you for your service um, you for the past few years. But uh, <laughs> especially in a week when uh, the speaker and the president, and I know you touched on this a little earlier, but um, are accusing each other of <coughs> being unable to pass legislation because of being too focused on an impeachment or, you know, an unimportant issue. Uh, what, how do each of you personally see um, the future of bipartisan legislation looking? Uh, well, you know, uh, like I said today, one of the reasons why I left is because it seemed like over the last few years the only thing that we were doing is continuing resolutions and omnibus votes. And, you know, the, everything else, the little bills that we'd send over the Senate would just go and sort of disappear. and. You know, I'm sure Joe would say the same thing uh, when, you know, now that it's a, a Republican Senate or whatever. But, um, you know, bipartisanship is important to get bills to the House floor and to pass. Certainly, if I've got Joe Donnelly as my co-sponsor, or better yet, if he's the sponsor in the Senate of the Senate bill and he's a Democrat, it definitely has a better chance maybe of getting through both houses and going to the president's desk. That's true. Um, those bills, though, are few and far between because most of the time leadership is focused on, you know, these big ticket items or what they have to pass. And whether or not something has to pass um, usually takes up all the oxygen. So um, I wish it was like Schoolhouse Rock, which you all don't even know what that is probably, but <laughs> there used to be this cartoon. It's like Jib Jab. Yeah, like Jib Jab. <laughs> they don't even know what that is. but. Um, 
you know, going from an idea to a, a committee to the House floor to the Senate to the president, um, you know, that's just very, very rare nowadays. So, um, but as far as the personalities on the Hill, I, I think what you see on TV about how much we hate each other, I, I mean, that's just not true either. I mean, maybe we didn't do a good enough job of showing to the public that, you know, most of us do get along. Most of us, when we're voting on the House floor, are sitting with your colleagues on the other side talking about whatever. Nobody knows what it's like to be a member of Congress more than another member of Congress, even if that's a Democrat. So being a member of Congress is a very unique thing. We have a very unique life. And it's nice to be able to talk to other people that understand that. And so I know he understands it. He did everything that I had to do to get elected. And he has to go through everything that I have to go through to keep that job and to deal with all the problems and successes that go with it. So we have a lot in common. Um, but our districts have gotten more and more partisan. And for me to get elected and to keep my title of the honorable, uh, it's really easy to just you know go there and talk about you know, how Pelosi's the worst thing in the world and Democrats are going to ruin this country. So reelect me, please. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there you go. It's kind of a paradox. You have to be dishonorable to be continue to be called the honorable. <laughs> so that, there's, can I, I just, yeah. let me just, Sorry. I just want to take one, you had your hand up, right? Because uh, I like half the people in this room are women and I, and, but not every, but not many of you have gotten a chance to ask a question. So, yeah. Okay. Nope. Is there a mic somewhere? You can hear. Hear. <laughs> no, no, but I think they want to hear. Yeah. 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 Oh my. Yeah, okay. Hi, I'm Isabel. Um, I want to go back to this question, kind of following up on the reparations. But how do we, when running a campaign, how do we struggle the balance between political reality and actual reality? And you can apply this to immigration in terms of. I have family members who live um, in New Mexico, right by the border, and they feel like their jobs are being taken, even though that's not the actual uh, statistic. So when we're running a campaign, it's I guess just, this will be applied to the Democratic campaign. Um, how do we straddle this difference, and how do we like appeal to both sides who, you know, are going by the political reality versus people who are going by the actual reality. Mm -hmm. Heather, would, yeah. would you address that? Sure, sure. Um, so this, this, is, this is like the million dollar question. Thank you for asking it at the very end here. Um, so I think all of our beliefs are <coughs> embedded in stories, right? Stories that we've been told, you know, growing up, um, stories that we've been told by the media and the more sort of crisp and compelling these stories are, the more they stick. And then other things that fit in that story stick to them and things that don't fall out. And in a way, politics is just storytelling, right? The person who wins is the person <coughs> who tells the most compelling story. And it's also the person who's heard telling a story is often the person who wins. And right now, we have a phenomenal mismatch between progressive and conservative or Democrat and Republican frankly, skill on storytelling and volume, right? Fox News remains the number one cable news network, you know, and has an incredible uh, right-drifting right effect on those who view it, right? It's been studied. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's unbelievable, right? There's, no, there's nothing like it in terms of changing the way people view the world because of the simplicity of the story. And the story now is really one of white racial grievance and threat and attack, right? And so you can start to see the whole world through that filter. And you can't say so easily what is the progressive worldview that I've suddenly put these glasses on because I've watched, you know, enough TV and listened to enough talk radio and listen to the president of the United States, who actually still has the largest megaphone in our society. Um, it's not so simple, right? It really isn't. Like, I had to work in a progressive think tank for a really long time to, like, maybe sort of try to get together a progressive worldview. It's not so easy. So I think that, A, it's about volume. Um, I was just looking at a, some data that came out that Donald Trump's campaign um, has spent more in Facebook advertising 
and micro Facebook advertising, right? Like you will get a different ad than you and you and you and you and you and you and you, and you than the rest of the people running for president combined. And that's huge, right? That is a huge advantage. And he spent $2 million last week as soon as um, Pelosi announced impeachment and you know, was ready with a video to go, right? There's just actually um, a big piece of it is the simplicity of the story and the worldview and, and the volume. Um, but just on a sort of personal level, one of, one of the moments that I had in my role as president of Demos was when I was on C-SPAN and in a live um, call-in show, and a man called in and said, I'm a white male and I'm prejudiced, and what can you do to help me? I want to change. And this was live television, and so I had to respond in the moment. And I ended up um, thanking him. This was like in the, the summer before um, the 2016 election. I ended up thanking him for being honest and giving him some ideas of what he could do. This is like, you know, rural working class veteran from, um, from North Carolina. So like, you know, the typical Trump voter. Um, that moment ended up going viral on the internet, and um, we ended up connecting with each other online and then in person multiple times. And so I, I know this Gary, my like racist caller from C-SPAN, he is um, <laughs> now someone that I would consider a friend. And he took my advice and also took the advice of a lot of other strange rabbit holes on the internet. But it's, um, he's a phenomenal human being, actually. And I do have hope that there is a common American story that we can tap into. But I don't think you get there without first admitting what your father did, um, without admitting that racism is real, it's prevalent, it's hardwired into all the messages we receive and how we think, and that we actually have to do something in order to actively create a multiracial democracy. Like, it's, not, it's not, certainly not automatic, and it's certainly not an automatic in a, in a society that had racial apartheid as its you know, spirit and law for most of its history. I guess, I guess the question is um, not whether we have to have that discussion. I said that we do have to have that discussion, and we have to have it tonally you know, in a way that leaves room for people to reconsider their thinking. The question really was, uh, what do we, in terms of winning an election, what <laughs> yeah. do we do? Yeah. And you know, I will tell you that uh, I worked for the last Democratic president who won, uh, and we were pretty careful about navigating around um, sort of ver uh, divisive cultural issues. As you know, and we were criticized for it. We we didn't run. Uh, 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 our campaign around the race, the issue of race. Um, but times have changed so much, David. I don't think you can put the Trump genie back in the bottle, right? Like right. he's no, said I understand that. politics I... are about race. And so we did this big research project at Demos and Demos Action that was looking to answer that question, right? Like how do you talk about race explicitly and honestly without alienating white voters or alienating even conservative Latinx and even some conservative black voters who are like, I don't want to talk about it. It's my life. I don't want to talk about it, right? Um, and we found a way, which was connecting it to the economy and populism and talking about how powerful people are trying to divide us and what they're doing that for is their own profit. And mm -hmm. Trump is the perfect example of this. Yeah. But I don't think, I think if you'd done that research eight years ago, you yeah, would, I it will, would I say, will, don't talk about it. I will race. tell you that the reason, there, and I don't think it got enough attention, the reason Obama won twice was by being very, very focused on these issues of economics. I mean, it's one of the reasons why he carried That's the right. state of Indiana, for example, mm -hmm. which people would have thought uh, impossible. So um, I, I just, you know, the question is, if the race is run around um, around reparations, around um, the border, you yeah. know, decriminalizing the border, around eliminating private insurance in four years, um, regardless of whatever you feel the merits of that are, is that likely to build the largest possibility of a, of a Democrat winning or not. And I mean... Uh, I think it's interesting because I think that there is a moment in which we talk about how we want to have difficult conversations and we want to say tough things. And voters will sometimes say, like, I want someone who is like this, but then they don't. They don't. They absolutely don't. And I think that there is an idea, you know, 
I remember, if you remember halcyon days of like June 2015, the GOP uh, put out a tweet before the first GOP debate talking about we've got 17 candidates, it's the most diverse group in <laughs> party history, and we wound up with Donald Trump. And so I think that what you saw, you know, I, I've talked about this a little bit, what Trump did really effectively was that he basically said whatever the people, and I know people say this about politicians, but Trump actually did it, of saying whatever it was he thought people wanted to hear. And I've said before that basically Trump became what a Manhattan liberal thinks conservatives are like. And you saw this when he talked about the issue of abortion. It was like, women who have abortion should be punished. And you saw pro-life groups being like, that's not what we think, but it sounds like it is what they think. And so that's how he could somehow be the best friend evangelicals ever had and the most pro-LGBT president of all time. He could bomb, bomb the shit out of everyone, but he's also a dove. The thing is, we won't be operating with candidate Donald Trump will be operating with President Donald Trump. Yep. And I think that those have proven to be two very different things. And I think, you know, if you have a campaign that talks about, like, hey, remember how he said he was going to drain the swamp and now everyone in the administration works for Raytheon? And, you know, people were building soundproof, $30,000 soundproof booths in their office, and everyone involved works for Goldman Sachs. I think that that's effective. But I do think that there is a sense, um, you know, I, I hope it's okay if I, if I swear a little. But I don't know if you remember during the 2016 campaign. horses left the barn. I know. During the 2016 campaign at Trump rallies, you would see these shirts that say, fuck your feelings. But I always wanted to follow up, like, fuck your feelings, but not my feelings. My feelings are very special and important. And you see this with kind of the idea of, like, this outward rage. But then, you know, they respond to it by being like, oh, no, we're being attacked. And so I think, and I think you see this uh, you know, among voters in a lot of different cohorts who are, it's a very much of a sense of like, you know, I call it kind of personal libertarianism. I want to be able to do things, but those people shouldn't be allowed to do things. And I think that if you're running a campaign, this is why I cannot run a campaign, because I would say things like this and then be gently shoved off the stage. <laughs> But I do not, think it's, not gently. Mm, no, I think it would be. I think it's important to recognize that sometimes politics is a matter of recognizing what voters say they want and then what voters do want. And I think that you know one of the truest moments you saw was when Chris Hayes hosted a post-election um, town hall in West Virginia. And he was talking to out-of-work coal miners who were like, yeah, hell yeah, we want Medicare for all. And they're like, do you think of yourself as being conservative? Damn right I'm a conservative, and I want Medicare for all. <laughs> and so, you know, terminology like conservative, Republican, Democrat, liberal, leftist, a lot of those don't tell you as much about what voters actually think or what they'll actually do. A lot of voters vote because they think other people are voting in a certain way. You saw that a little bit in the UK with Brexit, of people thinking, I, no one else is going to vote for this, so it's OK if I do. And there are some arguments that that happened a little bit with Trump as well. But I think it's important to recognize that there's how voters think, how voters think other voters think, hence the electability question, and then how voters want us to think about how they think. And I think that it, it gets really complicated, because yeah. you're dealing with the innermost feelings of voters who are asked to do something that is intrinsically challenging, which is to make a big decision for other people. Let me let me just uh, I, I just have to cut yeah. you off because we're Absolutely. we're way <laughs> we're running way over. And I, I would only say this, having done 150 campaigns, um, that um, I think that there is a major there are majority of people who share economic interests, uh, who really aspire to. A country in which they can um, they can thrive and their families can thrive, and I think there's a majority of people in this country who want to be part of a larger American community and uh, who don't want to be divided. And so I don't want to leave you all with a, c a cynicism about Sorry. this process. <laughs> No, everybody has to play their role. <laughs> uh, I don't want to leave you with a cynicism about this process because I've seen, um, I've seen a different side of our politics, and I, and I do think that, you know, every action creates a reaction. Uh, there is a market out there for something different, um, and uh, something that speaks more to community than division. Something, and there is a economic 
uh, commonality among many Americans. So, um, you know, I, I, I think th this is a discussion that we're going to continue to have. Let's if, just say that. If I could just say one thing, you can change the world. Just one person by yourself can change the world by doing what you think is right and working hard at it. I promise you, you can. I mean, I looked up, I'm in the Senate from a state that's Republican plus 14, and we have a vote to take away health care from 20 million people. I just happened to be on the floor that night because I won that election. And, and, you know, I had that privilege. You can make a huge difference every single day, and it doesn't have to be something like that. It could be helping a veteran get to the vet's clinic. You change their world by doing that. And you are the smartest, most talented, kindest generation that has ever been. So uh, you're going to save America, and we're really excited about it. <laughs> there, uh, there, there, wow, that's there, there, there no is a pressure for a better no, no, story. No, no, yeah. no pressure here. Um, I, I really have to. They're not going to be the kindest generation if I don't let them go. <laughs> so I just want to thank you. I hope you'll come and attend these <laughs> seminars. We're blessed with a wonderful group of fellows, and I hope you take full advantage of them. So thank you.